Hello everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director of the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. Uh, welcome to our series, Mud Talks. We thank you for attending today's event and we hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this time. This talk is being recorded and we will distribute the link and any presentation materials after. Uh, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box um, throughout the presentation and we will answer as many questions as we can. Uh, to start off, Lung Pacer Medical Incorporated recently received emergency use authorization by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for immediate use of their diaphragmatic pacing therapy system to help COVID-19 patients at high risk of weaning failure from ventilators. Today, lead inventor and founder of Lung Pacer Medical Incorporated, Andy Hoffer, class of 70, will discuss why so many ICU patients can't survive prolonged mechanical ventilation and how pacing the diaphragm can rescue patients from the ventilator. Andy holds advanced degrees in physics and biophysics. Currently, he is a professor of biomedical physiology and kinesiology and director of the neurokinesiology laboratory at Simon Fraser University. Without further ado, I turn this over to our speaker, Andy Hopper. Thank you, Andy. Hello, well, a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to not see many people that I haven't seen for 50 years, but I hope you can see me. Everything okay? Looking okay, Vanessa? All right, I have a slideshow that I will use to pace me through it. So, the title of the talk is, why is it that so many ICU patients can't uh, make it through mechanical ventilation. And the uh, second part of the talk is why we think that pacing the diaphragm is going to help rescue many patients, not everyone, but many from uh, being stuck on a ventilator. So I am a graduate from Harvey Mudd Physics, 1970. I know Don Brousseau and Steve Idelson are here, I noticed, and I'm very happy to, um, to be sharing this. I have been for almost 30 years now a professor at Simon Fraser University and in the next slide I'm going to give you a very brief capture of uh, what I have been doing since I was born in the late 40s in Uruguay, Montevideo, where I did all my schooling including pre-engineering with a one-year um, visit to Rochester, New York where I was an exchange student and that uh, opened up opportunities. After returning to Uruguay, I then uh, went to Harvey Mudd in 1966, graduated in 1970, and then did a PhD at Johns Hopkins in biophysics. And after that, I did a postdoc for the first time in Canada, so at Alberta. Um, and uh, then I went back to the States at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland as a staff fellow for four years until 82. 1982, I got my first um, faculty position at Calgary, Alberta, the other main city, Calgary and Edmonton are the two cities. And uh, I was spent nine years there, then moved to Simon Fraser in Burnaby, which is in Greater Vancouver, British Columbia, where I've been since. And uh, during this time, I've had a chance to uh, start three spin-off companies from my lab. First one was called NeuroStream Technologies, and the next one was Bionic Power, which I was a co-founder of, and the more recent one is Lung Pacer Medical, which is the one that I will be talking about. And uh, I don't know where things are going, but you realize that like all of those of us who were born in the 40s, I'm now living in my ninth decade, and so are you. And I don't know how much longer I will be uh, actively working as a professor, but for now I can see that happening. So I left some blank space here for some further activities, hopefully. So let's talk about the pacing the diaphragm or why the diaphragm needs pacing. So I'm going to have to give you a little bit of background on the physiology or the pathophysiology, what happens uh, when the diaphragm stops working. The diaphragm is actually two half hemispheres or two muscles in one. Each of the two halves is separately controlled by its own 
phrenic nerve that descends from the spinal cord at the neck level. And things can happen. There could be injury to the uh, nerve um, or there could be a spinal cord injury. There, there are many reasons why there may be a dysfunction, but in the picture on the right, we see what can happen when there is paralysis of one half of the diaphragm. It's this half of the diaphragm that it cannot descend. And the diaphragm, of course, uh, this uh, pumps air into the chest by descending actively. And there are many disorders that can cause this. Um, this is not going, I'm not going to cover all of them, but I'm going to cover uh, the two main types of patients that require some help because they cannot breathe on their own. The diaphragm is responsible for about 70% of all the inspiratory work. The other chest muscles are accessory to the diaphragm, but without the diaphragm, we cannot breathe. And um, the diaphragm alone can keep us uh, breathing if necessary, except for high levels of effort. Some people need help for the rest of their lives. For example, if they had a high cervical spinal cord injury or a brain injury or ALS, which is a degenerative brain disorder, or if they're born with a condition called central sleep apnea, and then they stop breathing uh, often in the middle of the night. Other people have a temporary need. The most typical one are people who are deeply anesthetized, like for surgeries. Anybody who has a surgery for a half an hour or longer, it's probably on a ventilator uh, temporarily because uh, when the uh, when anesthesia is given, it interferes with uh, um, breathing as well as relaxing all the muscles. And the other big category is people who are critically ill. They are in the ICU, and I will explain why, but they normally, when they're put on a mechanical ventilator, they are um, anesthetized as well. And uh, this is the common thing that happens in the ICU. In fact, modern ICUs are built around a mechanical ventilator and then uh, live uh, monitors and so on. Um, but that is uh, what most people in, in, in an ICU will experience. This has not always been the same. If we go back pre-1952, which is um, when the big polio ep uh, epidemic took place, the normal way to support breathing was with an iron lung, uh, which, uh, which produced negative pressure. So a person was placed inside this um, sealed uh, container and, and the air was pumped out rhythmically and that would produce it, uh, it would cause the chest to expand every time suction was placed in the box. That was actually a pretty physiological way to cause breathing because it caused the air to come into the lungs by, by expanding the chest. The other type was called a cuirass, which was a kind of a minimized version of the same that just surrounded the, the chest. Now this, of course, was very uncomfortable and not very portable, and there were not enough of them. So in a way that resembles the COVID-19 pandemic now, during the 1952 polio epidemic, there were so many new cases, and there were not enough um, iron lungs that patients were dying uh, in very large numbers in the very early 50s until a young Danish anesthetist um, decided to try to keep a patient alive. In this case, it was a, it was a young girl who got polio by putting a tube into her trachea, a, tra a, tra a tracheotomy, and pumping air into her with uh, bellows. You can see here, uh, hand pumping bellows rhythmically. Now that of course has to be sustained uh, continuously. And so they, they set up teams of med students and aides to take turns and keep people alive that way. But they were able to reduce very considerably the number of people dying from polio by keeping them alive this way. 
until the, the vaccines uh, were developed by um, Salk and Sabin in 1956 or so. And then, of course, that took care of that. But look how long it took. For those people who are hoping for a vaccine by the end of this year, it may be possible, but it is not always possible. In the meantime, the positive pressure mechanical ventilator uh, took um, its place and it became the, the standard of care for patients from then on. So it replaced the negative pressure um, iron lung. And uh, machines were built, the ventilators, which now everybody talks about ventilators. Well, they started essentially 50 years ago at that time and they were imposed at that time. Now, the problem is that positive pressure ventilation is a double-edged sword. It has serious risks. And the problem is that when you blow air into the lungs, um, you, uh, you make the lungs fill in an abnormal way. You are pushing air from the top rather than drawing air from the bottom as when the diaphragm uh, descends or the chest expands. So the distribution, the pressure distribution within the chest is abnormal. It's too high in the upper lungs and too low in the bottom, and it's okay in the middle. Now, ventilators in the meantime, in 70 years, they have evolved a lot. They are very sophisticated machines, uh, but basically they all do the same thing. They can either provide mandatory breaths, that is, they're programmed to repetitively um, make the person breathe, for, for example, 12 times per minute or something, delivering a constant volume, which is dependent on the size of the person. It's usually six or eight milliliters of air per kilogram. Or they can assist a patient um, to, to breathe a patient who can initiate breaths but very weakly and cannot um, take in a full breath, then the ventilator will complement that with a full breath, uh, or it can do both. It can let the patient initiate a breath and wait some seconds, and if the patient is not breathing, then it will take over. So they're pretty smart machines, but fundamentally they cannot avoid the the fundamental problem that they push air in and that itself is injurious. There are actually three types of harms that positive pressure ventilation causes. They're called the evil Vs by some. And those are ventilator-induced lung injury, or really, which I'll explain, ventilator-associated pneumonia, and ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, or atrophy of the diaphragm. I'll explain each of these. So first, the villi, lung injury, has actually three components. It's, it's caused by the volume that is put under pressure um, and atelectasis, which is a collapse of, of uh, some of the alveoli in the lungs, and then the fact that this uh, excess pressure causes injury to cells in the lungs and causes leakage. So the high pressure can cause edema, can cause uh, leakage of the contents of cells that line the alveoli, and it can cause excess air or pressurized air to leak out from the alveoli into the tissues that where it doesn't belong, and that's a pneumothorax. So all of these things are consequences of positive pressure mechanical ventilation. Atelectasis happens in the farther distal portions of the lung that where the pressure is never sufficient because, because the pressure is distributed uh, in, in the wrong way from top to bottom. And those alveoli in the distal lungs don't participate. They don't open and close because there's not enough pressure and therefore um, only a fraction of the lungs is participating in breathing. And, and this can be uh, irreversible damage. Um, atelectasis happens, by the way, um, to people under anesthesia just during surgeries. They come out of surgery and often they have atelectasis 
from which they can often recover, but, of, but sometimes not. And then they can uh, have issues like pneumonias as well from having been um, sedated and uh, on a ventilator for surgeries. There's a paper, a recent paper here, uh, anesthesiology tries to uh, review how to avoid these problems. And the, the result is it cannot be avoided. What you can is change the distribution of air, for example, to reduce the area of the lung that, is, uh, that has atelectasis, which is the more distal portion of the lung, um, which is here uh, orange, you can reduce it here by increasing uh, the level of PEEP. PEEP stands for positive end pressure, end expiratory pressure, which means that when you, when the ventilator relaxes and uh, after pushing a breath in, it lets go, the final pressure is not zero, it's above zero. That way, those alveoli maybe won't collapse. Okay, so you get this distal portion of the lungs to participate better, but look what happened to the proximal portion of the, of the lungs under higher pressure because of the PEEP, and its um, much larger area of the lung is now compromised because of high pressure than under other conditions. So it's no win, you can't win. You can distribute the air differently, but you cannot please the entire lung uh, with positive pressure ventilation. Another reason for concern is um, pneumonia, ventilator-associated pneumonia. A lot of people come into the ICU with pneumonia, but a lot of people get pneumonia if they didn't have it. And it's, uh, it's a hospital-acquired pneumonia. And that's in part due to the fact that in order to ventilate a patient, um, tube has to be placed down the trachea to deliver the air to the lungs. And that tube compromises the immune system because uh, the lining of the trachea is a place where um, some of the uh, protection from um, uh, pathogens that come in, uh, airborne pathogens, takes place. So a lot of the initial uh, immunity and protection takes place in the throat and the, the trachea, and that is um, not uh, is not works when you have a tube that goes all the way through. So that, um, so there, and also on top of that, there are some nasty bugs in hospitals that are resistant to um, antibiotics and, uh, and they're quite dangerous for that reason. And unfortunately, a lot of patients in hospital end up catching these things. So literally, if you're sick, the hospital is the worst place to, to be, unfortunately, um, in many ways. So, and this is before COVID. Um, this has always been. So, uh, the other one is ventilator-induced um, diaphragmatic dysfunction. With, um, and this is qu quite a severe problem as well. What happens is the diaphragm, as I said, is the main muscle for breathing. And it, it absolutely works. Uh, literally for the entire life without pause. From the first breath you take when you're born to the last breath, the, the, the diaphragm is, is involved. Um, and th in that sense, it is unique. The only other muscle that never stops is the heart. The heart is a very difficult, different type of muscle, different type of tissue. The um, diaphragm is skeletal muscle like the other muscles in the mm. Um, but the other muscles get to rest um, during sleep and when you're relaxed. The, the diaphragm never rests, except when it's sidelined. Like when you are placed on a, on a mechanical ventilator, the, the mechanical ventilator takes over and the uh, diaphragm for that reason uh, will immediately undergo what is called disuse atrophy because of lack of use. All muscles, by the way, will atrophy if you don't use them, you know that. But the diaphragm is, is more prone to it faster because it's not used to ever resting. And this is something that uh, has, was shown uh, conclusively in a paper uh, 
in March 2008. So um, rapid disuse atrophy in mechanically ventilated uh, humans, where they showed that patients who had been ventilated for not very long time, uh, between 18 hours and 69 hours, so under three days, on average, all the muscle fibers shrunk in size, atrophied more than half, by more to less than half their size, compared to patients who only were on ventilation for two to three hours. So this was uh, quite eye-opening. This paper has been cited well over a thousand times by now. Most of the papers that cite them say, whoa, that's horrible, what are we gonna do about it? They don't really come up with solutions um, be, uh, because this has been thought to be unsolvable. In fact, one review said that essentially we have no clinically available way to avoid it. One way that was tried was what people call daily vacation from sedation. And that is people in the ICU are normally sedated. They have a tube in their throat. They are very sick and, uh, and they are delirious and so on. And the thought was, okay, if you ease up the anesthesia and you let them try to breathe on their own a little bit, at least you'll exercise the diaphragm a bit, which is true but it's not enough to really keep it in, in good enough shape. So now there is um, something else that people thought about a long time ago already. And that is if the, if the phrenic nerves are the ones that are in charge of controlling rhythmically the diaphragm and somehow the brain can't do it, maybe the person is in a coma or unnes deeply anesthetized, how about electrically stimulating the phrenic nerves directly and uh, use that as a method to pace, to pace the phrenic nerves and to pace the diaphragm. This was Duchenne who um, discovered the muscular dystrophy, uh, it's called after him. And this is in the 1880s. And in fact, here's a list of people that thought about it uh, early on, Galvani, as soon as, electricity was discovered, um, they already started thinking, okay, this could be done to stimulate muscles, and, they, and Galvani showed it in frogs. Hufeland, 1783, he was a Goethe's doctor, and he already proposed in a paper that uh, stimulating the phrenic nerves could be used to, to save neonates who were asphyxiating, or babies. So, and then, uh, Progressively, people were uh, thinking about this. Uh, this one, 1818, Ure, showed that in a recently hung criminal who was literally dead, still it was possible to, if you go right away, go and stimulate the phrenic nerves, and the nerves and muscles are still functional for some minutes, and you can cause uh, respiratory like movement. And then Duchenne, as I mentioned, uh, until the 1900s, 1948, so right around uh, our birth with those classmates of mine, um, Sarnoff um, used uh, uh, electrodes to pace, uh, to implant uh, electrodes in a, in a patient, conscious patient, and show that this could be done. Glenn, in, in 1966 at Yale, um, developed a, a very advanced system at the time for people who needed it for the rest of their lives. Um, it was a totally implanted system, no wires crossing the skin, so radio frequency controlled. And this became a commercial device. Well, so now available for 50 years, I guess. Or um, And uh, that, that is a commercially available device. Now, unfortunately, Andy, yes? We do have two questions for you before you move on to the next slide. Okay. Do you uh, want the to first read? question is, do ventilators ever pump in air that is modified, such as air with extra ox oxygen or air with a dose of some kind of treatment? Yeah, that, that clearly is the case. In fact, the um, oxygen concentration is often varied or increased um, as needed and yeah, and the other thing is uh, uh, volatile anesthetics are mixed in as well. 
great. And then considering all the adverse, adverse effects of ventilators, why aren't iron lungs better? So some people are thinking these days that they are, but it's difficult to go back. There is a, there is a German group now that, is, that has a modern version of the iron lung. It's actually a plexiglass lung. Okay, so it looks like an iron lung, but it's made out of plexiglass. And uh, they are showing um, that it is better for, for the patient. The problem is that you invent something or you come up with something new, on the spur of the moment, it, it, it is an improvement. And you, it takes long time to catch up with the, with the side effects or the, or the unwanted um, things. But to be honest, the problems with positive pressure mechanical ventilation have been known now for, for quite a while. Um, so the thing is, it, it has not been replaced with something better yet. The iron lung, uh, people don't want to go back because it's cumbersome too. And it's difficult when, you, when the body is completely surrounded, you cannot uh, help the patient very well and so on. So it has drawbacks, but it's a better way to, to breathe. Great, thank you. But so then, um, alternatively to mechanical ventilation, um, pacing the diaphragm like, like uh, Glenn demonstrated that Avery does. By the way, not in many patients. Avery has implanted a few thousand of these systems over four decades. So it's not a lot, but it's for people who need it for the rest of their lives. And uh, those are surgically implanted. Well, before getting to that, a simpler way might be, do we need to implant? Okay, transcutaneous um, stimulation may work. People have tried it as far back as 1950. They had a pamphlet here, they had a device. This is the doctor here uh, placing an electrode on the neck, on the side of the neck of a patient and producing smooth induction of artificial respiration without positive pressure breathing. So they already were, thinking about it. This is 1950, so at the time of the, uh, of, of the polio, but it never caught on. You know why? It's not very practical. You have to tilt your head way back to actually reach and catch the phrenic nerve. It's not that superficial. And then if you want to catch both, you have to bend your neck the other way. And you can't do both at the same time. You can do it magnetically more recently now with a big magnet, and you can catch both phrenic nerves. Again, not very convenient. It's a good diagnostic tool. You can, you can quickly determine whether the phrenic nerves are connected to the diaphragm, whether you can make the diaphragm contract, but it's not practical to keep somebody alive this way. So that's why the surgically implanted solution um, was developed. Here is a child, uh, the here is an electrode on one phrenic nerve, there's another one on the other side. So it's done bilaterally, and then the electrode is connected to an antenna or a radio receiver, and there is a, a transmitter on the outside. The two antennas are controlled, or the stimulation is controlled from a box that the person has to carry. But this frees a person from having been, being connected to a ventilator, um, frees a person from having to have a tracheostomy or a tube down, and it, um, it causes negative pressure ventilation rather than positive pressure ventilation. So this is a very nice solution. It does take, so here's a current website of this company, Avery. Um, you can go see, but it is for limited types of people. People say who are paralyzed from the neck down, their diaphragm is also paralyzed. They may benefit from this. And some people can live for decades with this system. Uh, paper compared the advantages and disadvantages of phrenic nerve stimulation and uh, mechanical ventilation. So the most important one, no infections, zero um, issues of respiratory infection for 100 days with uh, phrenic nerve stimulation, two infections typically per 100 days in people who are on a ventilator. So that, and those are risky situations. So, and the disadvantages is the cost. Um, it's, it's a several hour long surgery, so there are risks there. 
and uh, it, you could cause a pneumothorax, you could damage the phrenic nerves, um, although they're getting good at it. But you cannot really retrieve that device if you wanted to, and then few patients really can benefit from this. So the other development came from um, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland in the 1990s, and that was to laparoscopically implant wires directly into the diaphragm muscle and stimulate the muscle that way. And uh, here are some pictures. Um, you can see an image of, uh, you have a probe. You're, first, you have to map out the surface of the diaphragm from the abdominal side. You push away the organs, filling up with CO2. And uh, then you find hot spots where you want to implant electrodes and you sew a pair of electrodes or more into the diaphragm and you then, they pull out the wires through the skin. And uh, the advantages are that the, the surgery is in the abdomen, not in the upper chest. So it's a little less risky and uh, it can cause pneumothorax. Um, there's less surgery than open chest surgery. And uh, however, it's still lengthy and costly. Um, and ironically, critically ill patients are not eligible. That's what I was told. And I learned this when my mother um, was uh, placed in a, on a ventilator in the ICU because she had pneumonia and she was rushed in and was placed on a ventilator. And I spent, I think that maybe this picture here. So this is a picture of me when I was a grad student at Johns Hopkins with my mother. And this is a picture of the hospital where she died actually uh, in Montevideo where I was born and raised and she lived. And this happened in, in December. Uh, I was there all the whole month of December into January, five weeks with her, watching her inability to wean herself from the ventilator. She had pneumonia. After two weeks or so, they treated her and got rid of the pneumonia. But now she couldn't pick up her own breathing again. And the reason was that her diaphragm had atrophied quite severely. And I suspected that without, this was actually a year and a half before that paper was published that demonstrated what happens to the diaphragm. But I, but it was a good suspicion that she didn't have the strength and the endurance to breathe on her own again. So I called the people here, uh, Tony Ignania actually, this is a surgeon, Raymond Anders, but I called the president of this company from, from uh, Uruguay and I said, look, my mother is in the ICU. I think she could benefit from your system. Uh, and she, oh, she is, oh, she's elderly. She was 82. Uh, she's critically ill. No, no, she would not be an eligible patient. A patient to, to implant this, a patient has to be healthy. Well, okay, that was to me, it was uh, bad news, but also it was an incentive to try to find a better way. And uh, so for patients who have a temporary need, because what I have explained all, until now is people with lifelong uh, need, but people with temporary need, I decided I want to come up with a solution. I had time to think about it. And uh, but actually I had the idea right here in, in, in this building. And uh, the idea was, all right, we know that pacing the phrenic nerves works, but can we do it in a simple way, a temporary way in the ICU without much surgery at all? So the idea was, it actually stemmed from having had to teach a course in general physiology here. I teach uh, biomedical physiology and kinesiology, but I'm a neuroscientist, okay, nerve and muscle physiology. I, I work with electrical stimulation of paralyzed muscles has been what I have done. Um, so I didn't know too much. I mean, I was a physics major, remember. But I learned the physiology I needed to learn to teach this course. And then I realized about the anatomical relationship of, of the key um, players. For example, where the left and the right phrenic nerves descend, which is very close to main uh, blood vessels, main veins that uh, enter the heart. 
the subclavian vein, the left subclavian vein, which it runs under the clavicle and the superior vena cava. And so the two phrenic nerves are at some place very close to this vein. And the other thing I realized being in the ICU, all these patients had some sort of catheter in them, more than one often. The catheter is to give them fluids, to give them antibiotics, to measure things, to take out sam blood samples and things. So the idea I had then was to try to stimulate transvascularly with an intravenous catheter. So if a catheter is placed that has electrodes and has some electrodes that are close enough to each of the phrenic nerves, then it should be possible to selectively recruit each phrenic nerve. Now, you could say, well, just pass enough current and stay recruited, yes, but you don't want to recruit anything more like the vagus nerve, which is very close to the phrenic nerve in each side, because the vagus nerve has a lot of other uh, properties and it will stimulate things then that are undesirable, like lower the heart rate and things, uh, if you are mistakenly stimulating the wrong nerve. So it had to be selective, very selective. So the first question was, how do you know where, that, where the electrodes are or where the catheter is when you place it in? Because you cannot see the nerves in x-rays. They're invisible to x-rays. So obviously the solution could be to just scan the nerve by introducing a catheter with an electrode and just stimulate every centimeter or so until you get, oops, this is working, the diaphragm is descending. And in fact, you should be stimulating one side and then the other side of the diaphragm. And that indeed is what we did in my lab. We uh, scanned every centimeter in pigs, pigs, which are a very good model for this because they are um, about the size of humans and the, the chest and the vasculature are fairly similar. So what we see here is the minimum current required to cause a twitch in the diaphragm or in half the diaphragm uh, as, as the catheter advances and it comes closer and closer to the phrenic nerve, which we don't see, but we, we can see the result. And then as we go past, it goes up again. So it's a very nice parabolic relationship, which is distance dependent. And this was a thrill. This, this, uh, this thing here is actually the graph of the first pig that I drew the points by hand um, on graph paper. And that, these are my students at the time, uh, undergraduate and graduate students. And uh, it, it was very exciting. This was April 2009. And a month later, we uh, found, uh, created a company called Lung Pacer Medical. Um, and uh, the, the idea was to produce these catheters. Now, this catheter has now 19 electrodes. The reason is that some of them should be ideal, but we don't know from person to person where those nerves are gonna be. So uh, this provides options. And a control unit that initially looked a lot like, uh, was intended to look a lot like a ventilator to sit next to it, that could use it to, to map where the nerves are and then to stimulate the, uh, the appropriate electrodes. So the principles are simple. Whereas a mechanical positive pressure mechanical ventilator pushes air in and that uh, is injurious, if you couple onto it um, diaphragmatic pacing and you link the timing of the pacing to the ventilator, let the ventilator be in charge, but assisted with negative pressure by causing the diaphragm to descend, that immediately should facilitate the job of the ventilator because it's got help now and it's easier to push air in. And that was shown immediately in pigs. Um, this is a later pig, but the same, same thing. So we, we see here six or seven breaths. Um, this is the required tidal volume. It's a ramp-like function, the ventilator is asked to push air until it reaches a certain volume and then it, it lets go. And the pressure that the ventilator needs to push air with is measured here. These are properties that the ventilator normally measures. 
and this is the airflow that produces that that uh, flow of air. So what you see, the big difference when, when we start pacing after three breaths of ventilator only is that the volume that is being delivered is the same or is actually a little bit more because the ventilator suddenly finds it easier to push air in because the diaphragm is helping. But the pressure it needs to, to push air in with is half or so of what it used to be. And that's very important because that pressure linked lung injury it can be instantly reduced by pacing. So with that, we sent a lot of patents. Actually, I submitted one first patent, but now there is quite a number of patents um, allowed um, that describe different features. For example, for the engineers in the audience, um, the timing of the stimulation is easily uh, set with respect to the timing of the ventilator. So, so this red trace would be what the ventilator is doing and we could have a threshold detection and we could have a, a pre-trigger that causes the stimulation to start a little bit earlier because muscles require some time to develop peak force, like about 100 milliseconds or so. So you, you may want to pre-stimulate knowing that the ventilator is gonna put a breath in and so on. Or you could uh, delay the start uh, if you want to, uh, whatever. So all these things are programmable. The, the therapist um, can specify how much the diaphragm should work because in some patients, maybe you don't want the diaphragm to work 100% because it would fatigue it. So you want to, it's like with any exercise program, you want to start easy but then progressively increase that so this is programmable but once you you decide that the um, control unit uh, decides it knows how much to stimulate uh, when and how hard to stimulate all the therapist has to do is control one dial so you put your foot on the accelerator and you determine the speed of your car that's more or less what this can do and it is a closed loop uh, feedback controlled system because there will be uh, reasons why the, uh, the actual output is different from the intended output. So you can have sensors, for example, we actually uh, monitor the flow uh, and, and the pressure that the diaphragm is producing with every breath and we can change that or the device can change it automatically if we want to let it. So it's a, it's a smart machine can do a lot of things. So clinically, what, what we are after is to protect the diaphragm, that was the first thought that would have helped my mother, protect the lungs from excess pressure, assist the heart as well, which I haven't mentioned, but the diaphragm is a pump and it pumps both ways. When, when the diaphragm relaxes and goes up, it helps bring back towards the chest venous blood from the legs. Now, venous blood passively returns, and in patients who are immobile, um, it pools in the legs. So this is a way to improve the return of venous blood towards the heart, and it helps the heart uh, reduce uh, infections, pneumonia, accelerate weaning, which is one of the key problems. 30% of people on ventilators, and this is before COVID, uh, fail to wean normally because by the time they spend four or more days on a ventilator, they're too weak. And now they have to go through a long process and uh, many don't win at all. My mother died March 12th and she got on a ventilator uh, the last day of November or so. So three and a half months or so. And uh, she never recovered full control of her breathing. So liberate patients from ventilation, reduce mortality and for those who survive improve their quality of life because every day that you can save on um, on the ICU is is another couple days longer you will live well we were lucky to win a lot of awards uh, pretty soon uh, some and grants grants and awards uh, mainly in British Columbia but also which one here San Diego the world's best technologies innovation marketplace. We 
went really to try to sell the technology or to get investors interested. We didn't know there was a competition and we won silver at the end of the conference, they announced that. And um, that was third place because it was platinum, gold and silver. Still good. I'm quite happy about having won silver. But anyway, uh, we got a lot of recognition and uh, very good grants from every good source in Canada. Um, we were able to move the company. By the, that time, it had 18 employees, which was about 10 more than my lab really could hold. And uh, uh, we went to leased uh, space uh, five minutes away from campus in Burnaby. And uh, Um, it's had very nice setups and uh, developed um, prototype devices and started testing them in people. So uh, basically, um, just to recap, the phrenic nerves run very close to main vessels. If we introduce a catheter, by the way, the catheter is a double function catheter. It also works as a fluid catheter, which was which is what every patient needs. So it's easy to tell doctors, you know what, if you think this patient is not going to wean from the ventilator within a day or two, you may want to put this catheter instead of a regular catheter, because then if necessary, you can pace the patient. And, that, and, and doctors always look to put few, as few things as possible. Catheters always have risks, any catheter. You have risks of infection or blockage and so on. So you don't want to put too many. And then with this one, uh, the device um, is programmed to very quickly scan through different combinations of electrodes and within literally a couple of minutes. By the way, the catheter takes two minutes to insert, okay, by an ICU doctor, that's, they're used to it. And it takes a couple of minutes to determine the best electrodes. Then you get a, a green light and you can press go and it starts pacing in sync with the ventilator. There's an airflow sensor here that measures the air that the ventilator is pushing in. So that was the original concept. Um, this is uh, Steve Reynolds with uh, ICU doctor locally. And with him, we did a lot of the pigs. We did 90 pigs. That's a lot of pigs. The whole team did eventually. And with the pigs, we got very good data that we published in three years ago, and we showed that um, not only did we reduce the pressure, here we paced intentionally every second breath. So one breath was, all the breaths were, the ventilator was active, but every second breath we paced. You could see that right away those breaths are, um, the pressure the ventilator needs to push is quite reduced. And this one I think is the one that doesn't work. So this is a, a movie that shows the diaphragm descending, but for some reason I couldn't get it to work right now, sorry. There's another one coming from a human. This is from a pig. But the idea is that in paced breaths, that diaphragm descends a lot farther than in, in ventilated only. And paced breaths where the passive pressure is low. And this is um, histology data which replicates that paper uh, of 2008 that was done in, in human patients. And we showed that also in the pig, in the uh, pigs that were 60 hours on ventilation, those that were paced as well as ventilated, the histology of the muscle fibers looked quite normal, but those that were only ventilated, they were quite atrophied. It's no big surprise, but we showed that pacing works, both to reduce the lung injury and to reduce diaphragm atrophy. And the other thing we showed is that pigs that had been paced um, for, for 60 hours as well as ventilated um, in all cases survived on their own at the end of the experiment when we disconnected the ventilator and said okay let's see if we can pace the, the animals were still under anesthesia but we paced alone to make sure that they could breathe Whereas the pigs that had been ventilated and not paced before, the diaphragm weakened and they quit after one minute, after four minutes, after six and a half minutes, the, the endurance uh, gave up. 
Um, so again, not only did we protect the diaphragm from atrophying and losing force, but also we increased their resistance to fatigue, which you need in order to continue breathing. So um, how are we doing for time? We're a little I think bit. We have about five more minutes. Um, I do have a few questions for you before. Okay. So let me try to finish this, maybe sure. answer the questions. We did um, human, tri human uh, trials starting uh, four or five years ago, and we did initially in Paraguay. And the first was a proof of concept that we could actually introduce the catheter without incident, and we could capture the phrenic nerves electrically, and we could produce stimulation, and we could um, reduce airway pressure and we in fact found that in every case except for a couple of exceptions that were because of the anatomy was strange in those patients and here is that movie so this is this isn't uh, slow motion kind of thing you can see the heart beating you, this is a diaphragm here and here okay you could see there a weak a weak dis, a descent was uh, the ventilator pushed it down and the next one is active there you can see it actively contracting. So um, again, we showed that every breath that was paced, the pressure the ventilator needed to the ventilator needed to push was less. And so we decided that this is uh, something we can do for two reasons. First, we could protect the diaphragm from undergoing that predictable. Um, atrophy. This, this here would measure, say, diaphragm strength or thickness over time. These are days. 28 days is a key time when intensivists uh, monitor patients to see if they have weaned from ventilation or not. How many vent-free days has a patient managed in 28 days? So we say that if we pace, pace early, we should be able to arrest that decline and rebuild the muscle. But even if a patient is neglected for say a week or so, for 10 days, but you start pacing later, it still should be able to rebuild the muscle faster than the patient can on their own effort with this, uh, with this daily effort at breathing a few minutes a day. So that would be rescue. Now, the, we went to the FDA with the data and in May uh, 2016, they granted an expedited access pathway, which means that they really help you and the FDA can really help if they want to help a project, but only for patients who have already failed to wean at least tw uh, twice. They made two efforts in two separate days. And anyway, um, those were the patients that uh, could be studied. Um, 36, at least 36 patents were allowed, already uh, granted in the US and about a equivalent number in other countries. And uh, five clinical trials have, uh, four, three were completed. And one um, in Europe is actually completed in 21 hospitals in Europe. And one in the US has enrolled 26 centers uh, by this past January, but they probably enrolled a few more by now. But these are paused because of COVID. So because of COVID, all the hospitals had to switch gears and, and drop research and do. However, the good thing is for lung pacer that the FDA has approved, uh, approved on April 14, emergency use, uh, not only in COVID patients, but in any patient in ICUs with a purpose of speeding up their recovery and freeing up ventilators. And they say in their own uh, letter that they expect an average of 2.4 days gained in patients coming off ventilators by pacing them. So I hope they're right. I mean, they used our data, um, but that is the state of the art. So for more information, you can go to lungpacer.com. They also have nice movies. I was playing one in the beginning. I don't know if it showed. And uh, uh, good animations about how this works. So, two minutes to go. Questions? All right, our first question. Does your product have the power to excite the diaphragm enough to breathe without the ventilator? 
that's a great question and the answer is yes. Um, depends on the patient. In a patient that has not been uh, ventilated for a number of days and the diaphragm has not gone downhill, the native strength of a diaphragm is, is very large actually because we need only a fraction of what the, what the diaphragm can put out for normal breathing because for running and other heavy effort, use a lot heavier breathing, the diaphragm can do that. So with electrical stimulation, we can replicate full breathing. That was not the first intention, but in the long run, I think it will be possible. Great. Uh, could this diaphragm electrical stimulation be coupled with a CPAP pump? Yeah, so um, yes, that could be a very good combination that would replace the need for uh, a tracheal tube, uh, just have a mask with a light positive pressure, which is what the CPAP does, and it facilitates um, air and the, and the pacing of uh, the, the pacing would do the rest. Yeah, that could very well be a solution for many patients. Great. Is there still a need for the therapist to check if the diaphragm is moving or whether something like the uh, vagal nerve is being activated. So if the vagus is activated, there would be consequences that show up right away and the, the monitor that mo monitors heart rate, for example, would immediately start buzzing if the heart rate were, would, would go way down because the vagus has been stimulated. So that takes care of that. It doesn't happen, by the way. It has not happened because the electrodes are very nicely designed to be very focused. If the electrodes were less well-designed, it could happen, but it doesn't happen in this case. Um, what was the other first part of the question? Um, so that, let's see. Oh, so is there a need for the therapist to check? Uh, and then- Right, so, the so the ventilator, the ventilator knows that something is helping because the pressure that it suddenly has to push air with is less than it would have been. So the ventilator may throw an alarm, but then the therapist comes in and calms the ventilator down and, and uh, lets, it overrides that concern. But if, so the ventilator also knows how much pressure the diaphragm is producing because that is simply part of the, what the ventilator is monitoring. So both the lung pacer system and the ventilator system know that the other one is working. The other thing I should have said for engineers is that um, there is no need to touch the ventilator internally in any way. The lung pacer works agnostically. There's many brands and models and types of ventilators, but that shouldn't matter because the only thing the lung pacer does is it monitors pressure from its own sensor and then uh, does not cause the, the ventilator to do anything different. Uh, we do have quite a few more questions um, and we are over time. However, we will get to one more question, but I will be sending all your questions to Andy and Andy will definitely answer. Um, and then we will put that on our website as well. Um, so Andy, for your last question, have you gotten feedback on how the lung pacer is working for COVID patients? No, actually, I, I wish I knew, but it's, uh, it's a little early. I really don't know uh, how many patients may have been treated by now. They will only be treated initially in those hospitals that were already participating in the um, clinical trials, because they're the ones that are equipped and they have the technical staff that is so eventually more hospitals will be added, but if you want to see what those patients are, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov slash lung pacer, sorry, uh, then you can see the list of all the, here, clinicaltrials.gov lung pacer, you will see the list of the 26 hospitals in the US where this is now available. All right, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for being our speaker today. Um, thank pleasure. you everyone.
for your questions and for attending this event. Uh, we will definitely be distributing the link of the recording and any presentation material. And also, if you do have any questions, we will take care of them. Uh, next up in the MUD series is a conversation with Harvey MUD College Professor Gary Evans and current trustee Josh Jones, class of 98, on Tuesday, June 9th at noon Pacific time. Finally, I want to offer a word of thanks to all those joining in today who have supported HMC's Community Emergency Aid Fund. To date, we've raised a little over $306,000 in gifts and pledges that will help us provide assistance to members of our community during these uncertain times. You can find additional information about the items I mentioned and much more on our online offerings page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hmc.edu and clicking on online offerings. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a great day. Stay safe out there. Thank you, Andy, once again. My pleasure. Take good care. Stay away from the hospital. I hope. Have a good day. Bye-bye.